Welcome to UO Today. I'm Steve Shankman, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest is John Lysaker, an Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy and currently Chair or Head of Philosophy. John Lysaker earned his B.A. at Kenyon College, his M.A. and Ph.D. from Vanderbilt. He came to Oregon in 1996. His teaching interests include 19th and 20th century continental philosophy, American philosophy, and the philosophy of art and literature. He is the author of the book, You Must Change Your Life, Poetry and the Birth of Sense, published in 2002. And he's working on two new book projects, Emerson and the Task of Self-Culture, under contract with the Indiana University Press, and with Paul Lysaker, his brother, Schizophrenia and the Fate of the Self, Life Among the Ruins, under contract with Oxford University Press. You've been a busy guy, and you're, <laughs> yeah, and you're, and you're running the department at the moment. Do I look tattered? <laughs> no, you look in pretty good shape, actually. Yeah, I have been busy. Maybe Emerson is good for your health. What do you think? Um, I, do, I do think so in a certain way. Uh, he's a very exciting author to uh -huh. read. He says in The American Scholar that one of the duties of the scholar is to cheer. And I think when people read Emerson, and definitely when I read Emerson, um, there's a sense of being called to a task that he believes you can accomplish. So I think he kind of inspires readers and sort of sets goals for them. And even in being a wily writer, nevertheless uh, keeps pushing us to chase him and to sort of come to terms with what he's saying. So there is a way in which I think uh, reading Emerson is a cheering experience mm -hmm. and sort of gives a, a jolt of energy. Is that what drew you to him? The I guess a, a couple things uh, drew me to him. One is he, he's a great writer, and I'm always attracted to uh, reading great writers that you have to spend a long time with people's books. <laughs> it's nice if they're good books. Yeah. Um, secondly, when I finished my first book on um, poetry and the birth of sense, I'd sort of worked my way into a, a view of the universe that had a difficult time making sense of a personal life being a project. As opposed to? Uh, as opposed to being a, a kind of... A Mind? Difficult, no, more of a, uh, a difficult thing to catch up with given how much of our being comes from beyond our control. Uh, so really, um, You Must Change Your Life in part tries to orient us in a universe where we're more of the effect than the cause, mm -hmm. um, although that language is kind of put to the side in the book. Uh, and I wanted then to figure out, well, if I'm not a self-possessed being from the get-go, and I'll probably never be a self-possessed being, if my best moments more dawn upon me, uh, if I'm more possessed by insights than in possession of them, mm -hmm. the way Emerson sort of, sort of puts it, then uh, how is it that I still experience my life as a task? Can I, you know, is it something I can succeed at or fail at? Or is it more like being just the uh, face of a geometric shape? And uh, mm -hmm. I do think there's a very personal dimension to uh, our lives. Uh, and we can do a better or worse job at being ourselves and becoming who it is we want to be. And so I turned to Emerson to try to articulate mm -hmm. that, since that's really the heart of his work, uh, self-culture. Um, but I call the book uh, Emerson and the Task of Self-Culture because it begins with the premise that being who we are is something that's a task. We, it's not just sort of existing like a rock on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a way in which being John Lysker or being Steve Shankman is something we aspire to be, and there are days when we think, I, I failed miserably mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at uh, being the person I'd sort of set out to be. So it was to try to articulate that uh, dimension of our sense of ourselves while acknowledging that it's not just about running around saying, make it so. You know, we, we, there's a big project uh, in being who we are that's about self-knowledge and self-discovery and it's ongoing mm -hmm. and we can be very confusing to ourselves. So it's not just about legislating who we want to be. Uh, so in other words, it's, it's not a self-help book for self-legislation <laughs> and quickly zipping up a corporate ladder. Right. So uh, I remember, uh, I, don't, I can't remember how long ago it was, it was probably longer ago than I would like to uh, think it was. but. You were saying, you know, I'm really not sure what I'm going to do with this, with this next project, you know, and, and uh, you were very honest about it. You were very open about the fact that you weren't really sure where you were, were going after you wrote your first book. Yeah. When did it become, when, when did you get the sense of what it was you really wanted to write about next? I guess I knew, um, 
there's sort of two sides to that. One is I knew I wanted to try to talk about um, the personal dimensions of experience. What's it like to be uh, a human being who realizes that uh, the insights that should govern a life aren't ones that they're fully in control over, mm -hmm. but ones they have to respond to. But then I wasn't quite sure how to proceed. And I also wanted to take up something that was outside of the context that I was introduced to in graduate school. As you know, coming out of graduate school is also being introduced into a social group mm -hmm. uh, with its own support system, but also it's normalizing expectations. And I guess I was having a second Oedipal struggle mm -hmm. <laughs> and wanted to break free of that. Uh, and Emerson fit the bill in all regards. Uh, it wasn't right. part of the uh, canon that I was schooled in and right. coming in, into continental philosophy. Yes. Uh, but it was something that nevertheless spoke directly to a problem that I thought was imminent mm -hmm. to the authors I was interested in, mostly uh, Martin Heidegger, Jacques Derrida. Uh -huh. And so uh, it's like I could have the best of, of both worlds, both right. antagonize my uh, uh, professors <laughs> from graduate school, but uh -huh. in a way that they could recognize as a sort of extension of uh, the thoughts that they had uh, given to me and which I was expected to continue on. So tell me where poetry and art uh, fits into fits into this, because I know that was a that was a large part of the first project. Right. And where does it fit in, or or is it is it part of this of this next one? Um, it fits in a little. There's some poems I introduce into the Emerson book, uh -huh. uh, Whitman. I sing the body electric. Uh, there's one poem I also use in You Must Change Your Life uh, from Dennis Johnson called The Heavens. Uh, just in case anyone had actually read the first book, that uh -huh. would be a, a signal that there's some continuity. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, but part of it has to do more at the level of the literary and thinking about the nature of the essay. So the first book looked at forms of presentation uh, in the form of the lyric mm -hmm. and how the form of the lyric is itself uh, uh, something to meditate on and as much a part of the communication of lyric insight as whatever any particular poem is about. And so I wanted also with Emerson to look at the essay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I this always interested in philosophy of art and particularly in relation to the genres that occur in the arts but also then the genres of philosophy such that art is not just the subject matter of uh, my philosophy but I worry about how philosophy is itself a kind of art and what would it mean to fuss over questions of genre. So just at that formal level mm -hmm. uh, the Emerson book has a lot to do with the nature of an essay, how it should I be see. read. Uh, so in terms of lyric, and in the, in, 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 did the did the notion of lyric at all have to do with this idea of you of, of one's sort of somehow finding oneself in in a world and and, and maybe not having the kind of control? Absolutely. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the lyric insight being that um, what I sometimes like to call the muse phenomenon that uh -huh. this extremely personal poem I'm not quite the author of. What does I it see. mean that where I experience myself I most intimately, mm -hmm. I'm not the author? of uh, the insight. Uh -huh. And so that sort of, you know, which is right at the heart of the lyric phenomenon right. as a kind of existential phenomenon for, for human self-knowledge. Yeah. Also then, uh, Emerson says very much uh, the same thing. He'll start with that. He calls them involuntary perceptions mm -hmm. or uses the figure of genius. Mm -hmm. uh, but in these lyric ways, and there's even a temporality to the Emersonian essay, which is like the lyric, which is it always occurs in the now. Mm -hmm. The Emersonian essay is in the now of an address to a reader, so mm -hmm. it's as though all of its meanings are occurring right then when you're reading it. Right. And that's a lot like a lyric poem as well. Yeah. This is an explicit part of the book, but the continuity is, is right. strong there, at least for me. Of course, <laughs> when you have essay, then, you're, then, you're, then you are, I guess, in a sense, trying, trying something out, doing, doing something. Completely. Mm -hmm. That's uh, another thing uh, that's dear to e uh, Emerson, and that's the idea of essay as a venture or as an experiment. Mm -hmm. He has a famous line where he lists Plato and Chaucer and Dante, and then he says, I too will essay to be. Uh -huh. um, both showing that his writing is part of his own self culture, mm -hmm. but also that it's a venture or an experiment, a trying out, and mm -hmm. even a kind of praxis. Mm -hmm. um, I guess Stanley Cavell, I guess, is a famous uh, philosopher who, who uses Emerson, but uh, what kind of status does writing a book about Emerson have today in philosophy departments? The, uh, we will soon find out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll see if I become full professor. <laughs> um, I guess I'll tell this by way of a story. I was uh -huh. talking to one of my uh, 
readers from my dissertation, John Salas, a uh, sort of philosopher who works with Heidegger and the Greeks, sort of the whole history of philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, huge, important influence on me. Um, and was sitting around talking with him and his wife, Jerry Salas, who uh, uh, teaches writing and argumentation. And I was saying I was going to work on Emerson, and I saw the eyebrows raise. I said, I guess I'm drawn to him because, <coughs> you know, in the Divinity School address, he shows up at Harvard, and he's talking to future preachers. And he starts telling them that while well, Jesus was insightful, maybe he wasn't the last word on it. And I enjoyed that kind of punkish approach. Uh -huh. And I remember Jerry looking at me, Riley, and going, really? That surprises me. So part of uh, what's the pro what's the that I would write on someone who proved to be a, a punk. I see. <laughs> and uh -huh. try to so this is the bring new, an insight uh -huh. to a maybe unwilling audience. Right. And I think right. partly that's what's at stake with me, uh, with Emerson. Uh, absolutely, he's been exiled from uh, the philosophical canon. Really? I don't think most people regard him as a philosopher. And if he is, he's a bad one because he contradicts himself, according uh, to readers who aren't able to read segments of an essay as having different voices. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's all the univocal voice, and so it's as if he's saying right. P and not P mm -hmm. uh, when he's trying out things from different angles sure. and modeling different perspectives. So part of this is to... Um, contribute to the kind of work that Cavell has done, Cornell West has done, mm -hmm. uh, Russell Goodman, University of New Mexico, all philosophers who, uh, Doug Anderson, South, Southern uh, Illinois University, all, all of whom have tried to just without apology uh, regard Emerson as a philosopher. And I'm doing the same thing, although my background is different than all of those folk. It has much more to do with the debates in uh, Heidegger and continental philosophy, mm -hmm. Derrida, Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, and uh, Theodore Adorno. So my rehabilitation or my attempt to champion him in a philosophical context is relative to a different group of interlocutors. But it, it mm -hmm. may uh, fall on deaf ears. It may just be, well, John decided to write on this punkish guy. And, mm -hmm. You know, that's really what that's about. But I think there's so much going on in Emerson um, that to adopt that view is kind of silly. But Emerson knew a lot about philosophy, didn't he? And he, uh, we, we know he read in, in uh, Indian Indian philosophy and I mean, what, what sort Chinese of philosophical, philosophy. what sort of, which was pretty unusual in those days. What kind of philosophical education did he have? Uh, he was a Harvard BA. Uh huh. Uh, he had a lot of background in Scottish common sense philosophy. Mm -hmm. It was sort of the philosophy of the day. Uh, he was uh, an obsessive reader of Plato. One of his notebooks is called Platonia, mm -hmm. where he just records all of his thoughts on Plato. Plotinus, um, definitely the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Emerson's so picked over, you can acquire a book called Emerson's Library, and it lists every book he had right. at the time of his death. So we know that he had uh, Bhagavad Gita translated in 1793 uh -huh. or so. Uh, but he read that. He uh, read uh, in Hegel and Schelling. Uh -huh. um, uh, his brother had studied over in uh, Göttingen and so had brought over Schleimacher and biblical hermeneutics. Yeah. So he really he was a cosmopolitan right. Right. reader. Uh, right. You'll find in his text cites to the Quran, uh -huh. um, uh, Hebrew scripture, Christian scripture. So it's, there's really something about him right. uh, that is, not that he succeeds in a truly universal way, yeah. but here's someone for whom no one is excluded from readership mm -hmm. or from being read simply because of where they come from or what their beliefs are. So there's a kind of virtue of cosmopolitanism in him that uh, I think is exemplary and draws him to me. But, uh, you know, he, he was no slouch in philosophy either from what you're saying. So for philosophers or academic philosophers to have, have qualms about, you know, it's, it's not right. like dealing with someone who, you know, doesn't know anything. Yeah, you know, partly though it's a... Uh, the amateurish... Like the fact that he's an amateur or something like that? Or just the essay tradition. I see. You know, I think there's a, the genre in philosophy shifted to uh -huh. the journal article uh -huh. in the 20th century. Right. And very narrowly focused, uh, idolizing uh, deductive reasoning. Right. So from a certain premise, everything else should follow. Yeah. Uh, and that's not the way the essayistic tradition proceeds. Uh -huh. It moves around. It mm -hmm. comes at things from different angles. It adopts uh, personae. And I think there's an impatience with that. Wow. But I just view that as an impatience with the human condition. So <laughs> if he's not a philosopher, I don't, then philosophy exactly. doesn't have much to offer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, tell us about, you're, you're going to be giving some lectures, uh, uh, or you're going to give, you know, you're going to do a session in, in town. Right. You want, you want to tell us 
something about that and its relationship to Emerson's whole kind of way of, of being in the world as, yeah. a, as a thinker. Yeah, my hope is to sort of uh, give a general talk, um, Emerson's spiritual exercises, to just try to look at writing and reading in an Emersonian context as a way of exploring oneself and beginning to practice to be oneself, to acquire certain virtues of patience, uh, of endurance, of courage, uh, of imagination, uh, of taking responsibility for what one finds, even in a canonical text. So it's a way of modeling how to relate to authority. Mm -hmm. All of these are things that we can practice in Emerson. And so one is to just give a talk to say, do we look at our reading and writing as spiritual exercises? Or are we just processing information? Um, or are we trying to master a text? Uh, and so one of the goals is to just sort of share that thought, uh, which I think resonates with people. I've done stuff like this before in Santa Rosa, California, and I was amazed. It really resonated with people. They, they wanted to think about reading and writing in that way. Mm -hmm. Half did, but felt more empowered to continue to do so uh, when encouraged to uh, by someone who supposedly knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. I guess that was me in that context. Right, right. Um, and this is a kind of Emersonian uh, thing to do. He lectured widely, gave over a thousand lectures in his life. Um, was he good at it? Uh, you know, there are certain people who found it uh, annoying, but on the uh -huh. whole, yes. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, that's half how he made his living, is people would come and pay a little bit to lecture. And uh, he must have been good enough that he kept mm -hmm. being asked to do mm -hmm. so. He participated in the Lyceum Movement, which was sort of ongoing education uh, in New England in the uh, 19th century, although primarily not for people who had gone on to uh, Harvard. You know, these are people who had left at a certain point and just wanted to hear, what are people thinking about? Mm -hmm. um, and so that really attracts me. Uh, it seems to me that uh, remaining cloistered in the university, uh, as pleasurable it is, which is very pleasurable, mm -hmm. uh, we're still uh, obligated, I think, to continue to talk with folk. And not because there's wisdom that needs to somehow be brought out, but because that's a different scene of engagement where I can learn things and where I have things to share. And that'll produce a kind of different uh, mm -hmm. set of insights and questions for me and for others. And so just sort of wanting to break out of my graduate school training, now mm -hmm. kind of wanting to break out a little bit of the uh, corridors of PLC, mm -hmm. which is hard to describe as an ivory tower, but I see, <laughs> I see the point of the image. <laughs> um, would it were an ivory yeah, tower? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Then, <laughs> yeah, then we have Steel. And the cement something. bunker, I yeah, call I, it. The I, cement bunker of the that, academy. I think, I think that's more like it. <laughs> um, I'd like to turn now to your work on, uh, on schizophrenia. I mean, it's very interesting. All of a sudden, you've got a contract from Oxford University Press. Right. Uh, so, I, how did you get this? How did you get this contract to do to do a book on schizof yeah. schizophrenia? Yeah, I made them an offer they couldn't refuse. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, my brother Paul Leisker uh -huh. is a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. He works um, with people who suffer from schizophrenia yeah. in a hospital context in Indiana. Uh huh. And uh, we were at a big family reunion, and he, we were talking about his work, and I've always talked to him about uh, this work, and he thought that the encounters with schizophrenia that he was reading about needed to be more sophisticated relative to the theories of the self they were employing. Uh, that's kind of been an ongoing interest of mine, mm -hmm. uh, not the sort of front porch of my publishing career, but something I'm continually working on. I teach a big course called Human Nature. This is something I've always thought about. And so we went ahead and did it. We wrote an article, um, 3,000 words, something like that. And, and what, in what venue? For, uh, for, the, for whom? Uh, for the uh, British Journal of Medical Psychiatry. Uh -huh. I could be misremembering. Uh -huh. um, but for a social science journal uh, that wanted to combine clinical data with, or more, this is actually more of a, uh, a theory journal uh, in psychology and psychiatry. And uh, they loved it. They accepted it. There were no revisions. It started to get cited. Um, and we thought, well, let's write another one. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, we went around to different symptom clusters uh, having to do with schizophrenia and bringing our sort of uh, theory to bear on it, which is more or less something like the following. Being human is not, uh, or put it this way, being human is about moving among different aspects of a life, not simply expressing or manifesting, manifesting a core self. 
So we view ourselves as dialogues. We talk some about Bakhtin in this regard. We talk some about Nietzsche. Um, but being human is sort of moving around. So if you and I were to see each other in the halls of PLC or at a meeting or at a grocery store or if we had gone hiking um, or say if we were even cousins, different aspects of ourselves would show up in each of those meetings and the task of being who we are would be to adjust to the, the demands of those different situations and the different facets of our relations. And our claim is that people who suffer from schizophrenia struggle with precisely that. It's not a global break of the self because primitive urges overthrow the ego, which mm -hmm. is a kind of crass psychoanalytic view. It's really an inability to do, uh, as well as many people, something that we all face. Uh, and this, I think, has advantages. It establishes a continuum between those who suffer from schizophrenia and the rest of us, so mm -hmm. we can see their struggles as akin to ours, because we all struggle with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there'd be moments where if we were in a business meeting, uh, and we were trying to negotiate something, and all of a sudden an old lover shows up on the other side of the negotiating table, we might really struggle. We might mm -hmm. wonder, what, what's going mm -hmm. on here? This mm -hmm. is a curveball. Mm -hmm. um, or if we were teaching a class and we were in psychotherapy, and all of a sudden our th psychotherapist enrolled and was a student in the class, this mm -hmm. would be complicated. We'd have difficult negotiating this. So I think part of the power of the view is that it establishes that continuum. Uh, and it caught on enough mm -hmm. that we were able with that view to take it to a variety of symptom clusters. So over four years or so, we had probably 15 articles, 16 articles. Wow. Uh, some in philosophy journals, most in psychology and psychiatry journals. And then we thought we'd pitch it as a book. So the main reason Oxford, I think, accepted it is the pricey made some sense. Right. But also there was a fairly established yeah. publication history behind right. it. Right. So it had already kind of been peer reviewed and uh -huh. from a variety of different theoretical vantage points, uh -huh. some experimental, some theoretical, some philosophical, some psychological. So we still have to finish it, but right. we're probably more than half done. But it must be breaking new ground then for them to have wanted to publish it, um, or yes or no? I think so that they're taking a risk on a theory which uh, uh -huh was more or less created by us. Right. So that is breaking new ground. So they, they, they're taking a, a risk with it, um, but it's slightly test-driven, at least at the uh, article level. Right. So tell me about, um, so do your, does your brother actually work with, with schizophrenic patients? Yeah, that's uh, his primary uh, right. uh, patient base are people who suffer from schizophrenia. And so what, how has this work he's done affected his actual clinical practice? Part of the uh, last chapter of the book, some of the articles have been about therapeutic impact mm -hmm. of the view. Um, I'm speaking, you know, for him right. now and not as an expert and uh, yep. so this is a don't try this at home disclaimer. Yes. <laughs> but the basic view is that if a major problem that arises when one suffers from schizophrenia is an inability to sort of weave together in a more or less coherent narrative, a variety of different aspects of the self, or what we call self positions. Part of the therapeutic goal is to empower that capacity. And this connects up with sort of narrative theories of the self, mm -hmm. to empower the capacity to tell a story about our lives that makes sense and enables us to better negotiate our lives. And <clears throat> this leads to a kind of therapeutic stance where one isn't in an authoritarian way telling people who they are or how they ought to be, one's facilitating uh, their own telling of a story about themselves. So what this might mean is pointing out over time uh, how aspects of the self are arising and then disappearing, mm -hmm. or arising and not really coming into any real conversation with one another, but sort of just flying off in many directions, mm -hmm. or dissolving into one particular narrative, say in the case of paranoia. Uh, where it's just always about being persecuted. So uh, we sort of call it the dialogical prosthetic, where uh, the therapist is coming in and reintroducing characters that have fallen out of the story, uh, pointing out connections that could be made, and just trying to build that dialogical capacity. Mm -hmm. Now my hunch is this is partly what he was probably doing before, and he has new words for it, but it's really uh, shifted some of the things he does in terms of tracking what people say, what he observes, what he reports back to them. Uh, and he views himself now as less uh, co-author of the story that they're unfolding and more as just trying to empower their authorship mm -hmm. and have that be an explicit part of, uh, 
of the communication. And does this go, it's obviously, or I don't know, it's accompanied by medication as well? Yeah, this is not a standalone right. uh, therapeutic uh, uh -huh. practice. So uh -huh. it often is accompanied by medication, um, the uh, different forms of rehabilitation, including occupational rehabilitation, where people are given jobs uh, within a hospital context or outside, mm -hmm. and whether or not treating them as capable of completing tasks and succeeding in uh, task-oriented situations actually has rehabilitative inf impact. Uh, so, yeah, the therapeutic is an accompaniment, psychotherapy is an accompaniment to lots of other uh, treatment strategies. Although we insist that without it, they're worse off. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, patients report that without out it, they feel worse off as well. Without? The therapeutic component. Right, right. Um, so he's seen differences then. He's, he's, see, he's seen things happen with yeah, his we patients. Have, yeah. And, and, you, and have you, have you, been, have you uh, been present with, the, with, with his own patients? No, I uh, participate by proxy. Uh -huh. uh, I get transcripts and names are changed. Mm -hmm. And that's to not just protect uh, confidentiality, but to respect the kind of intimacy right. exactly. of the therapeutic mm -hmm. uh, setting. And I don't want uh, to contribute to someone's experience of themselves as an object of yes, scientific I, study. Yeah, I understand that. Um, they know they're participating in things of this nature, but right. it's not the visceral uh, presence. And my fear is, I was really called out by someone, I'm not doing this, how could I know? And mm -hmm. My response was, I don't want to turn therapy into a petting zoo. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be to really sort of, I'm here to observe right. someone who's different. Right. That sort right. of, I yeah. think I can, uh, in a methodologically secure way, do what I need to do just with transcripts, which are the first person presentation of the person. So mm -hmm. I'm still working with the language that mm -hmm. they're using. Mm -hmm. Well, John, it's been great speaking with you. Likewise. Thanks, thanks very much for being right. with us. Thanks for having me. And we've been speaking with John Lysaker, who teaches in the philosophy department and is currently head of philosophy at the University of Oregon. Thanks for watching.